Now, you might have seen an interview yesterday with my colleague Tom Connell. He spoke with the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Keith Pitt, about his decision to veto a proposed Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund loan for a wind farm in Queensland. Now, Pitt suggested the proposal was rejected, was rejected for failing to meet criteria for being affordable, reliable and dispatchable. And their exchange was, well, it went around a bit like a wind turbine. Can you tell me, though, what size, for a 157 megawatt wind farm, what size battery do you need to make it dispatchable? Uh, well, Tom, what I can tell you is that intermittent wind and solar... Is, that's a not, basic question. ..is not dispatchable. But it is with a battery if it's big enough. Uh, well, I've made a decision based on what we're... Yeah, hang on, but that's just a basic question. I just don't understand why you won't agree that it could be... ..that a battery can back up a wind farm. Now, on it went. Forget the semantics of the word dispatchable. The real issue here, the one Tom wasn't given an answer on, was whether batteries are a viable backup for a wind farm. And didn't the climate evangelist chortle over this exchange? It's been a big hit on social media. TEN's political editor, Peter Van Oslen, said, this is beyond insane, the, referring to the interview, a must-watch. ABC Sydney radio presenter Wendy Harmer said, lots of great stuff coming in this space, including Keith Pitt one day being able to utter the word battery. Republican movement chief Peter Fitzsimmons said... What am I missing? Why does Minister Pitt prevaricate? Why is it such a sensitive thing to acknowledge the obvious that a battery can back up a wind farm? Sky Journo doing a good job here holding him to account. Notice that a wind farm can be backed up, he says, by a battery. Greens leader Adam Bant says, just astonishing. This is why the Libs can't be allowed to use the fund to support new coal and gas projects. This week the Greens are moving amendments to stop that money going to coal or gas through the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund. Will Labor support it? And the Warringah independent Zali Stegall, a climate activist, of course, says this would be funny if it wasn't so sad. Keith Pitt is the Minister for Resources. Australia has lots of the world's rare earth minerals to make batteries. This is the industry of the future. We could be world leaders in lithium batteries, but instead we get this. I mean, check it all out. It's all hail the coming of the mega battery. They're just pretending that the battery thing is easy. You have a wind farm, store the energy in a battery. Stegall becomes all sort of a mining advocate now for rare earths. These politicians and journalists mock pit, but seriously contend that batteries are a way to firm power supplies from wind farms. If they stop to think for just one minute, they might realise that if that were the case the whole world would probably be net zero already. I mean, energy storage is the problem with renewable energy. It's the only issue, really, the big one. But these politicians and commentators think there's already some kind of big battery nirvana. Let's take, for example, South Australia's so-called big battery. It's the biggest in the world it was when it was first built a few years ago. A hundred million dollars worth of battery with taxpayers stumping up an undisclosed share. Now, sure, it's helped to smooth out the grid in the new renewables world. Good. And it makes money by buying cheap and then selling high. But as a firming tool, I mean, give me a break. It doesn't pretend to do that job. This massive installation would power South Australia, by far the smallest mainland state, it would power it for less than three minutes. Or it would power that proposed wind farm, replace the energy from that proposed wind farm in Queensland that Keith Pitt was talking about. It would, it would make up for that energy for one hour. So how many $100 million batteries would one state need to cover a full day of a wind farm being in the doldrums or a windless week? Here's a reality check from physicist and engineer Mark Mills, who's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And wind and solar only work when the wind blows and the sun shines, but we need energy all the time. The solution, we're told, is to use batteries. Again, physics and chemistry make this very hard to do. Consider the world's biggest battery factory, the one Tesla built in Nevada. It would take 500 years for that factory to make enough batteries to store just one day's worth of America's electricity needs. There you go. Now, there's plenty of people barracking for, a new, for a renewable energy. No good on them. It's a free world. And renewables, of course, have lots of obvious attractions, but it's no good pretending that batteries are the easy solution. You can't run an electricity grid on make-believe.
Let's go back to Canberra now and catch up with the former Resources Minister, Matt Canavan. Matt, um, honestly, if it was that easy that you just have wind and a battery could store it, I mean, this is the whole problem, right, in a nutshell. You can't do that. Well, exactly, uh, Chris. And, and the first point to make here is that while those proposing to build a, a wind farm or invest in renewable energy, they should, it should be incumbent on them to have the answers. OK, how are you going to back it up? And how often over the course of an average year would the lights go out with certain sizes of battery? And the fundamental problem with uh, Tom's questions and, and the back and forth there yesterday is the, you, you, it's not as easy to say, well, how much do you need as backup? What you need to say is how much of the year uh, will you accept the lights going out? Because you could have uh, no wind power for weeks, for months. Uh, it's very variable. But you've got to decide what risk uh, you'd want to accept. There was a study done in New York or, or New York State uh, a couple of years ago which showed that if, if they were to back up just New York City's power needs and, say, have a backup of seven days, so you could, if we went without wind with a week, for a week, you'd have enough power to last New York for at least seven days. If it went into the eighth day, well, that's lights out. But seven days, let's choose that. It would take... It would, New York City would have to spend $3 trillion US dollars installing batteries to do that. $3 trillion US dollars just to do that. And uh, New York's uh, demand is about... It's not too far off New South Wales. Or well, if you take the demand, I just checked, New South Wales currently at the moment using 9,000 megawatts. That's 70% of New York City. So you'd need a, a batteries to cover that demand of about $2.5 trillion Australian dollars to cover yeah, well, New South Wales. Man, that's bigger than our GDP. It's in tonight's budget. So we'd spend our exactly. whole year's income just building batteries for New, New South Wales. This is ludicrous. It is ludicrous. I mean, that one wind farm, 150 megawatts, the South Australian big battery at $100 million would replace that for one hour. So, I mean, it's just... This is the, yeah, the, that... the, the, the number of the problem. Um, just getting to the budget, I just want to... You know, as a, as a, as a Conservative, are you worried about the debt and deficit? Do you think that your own government is is looking at repairing the fiscal situation quickly enough? Well, look, I haven't seen the budget tonight yet, Chris, and uh, what we do know is that more than likely the deficit will be much lower this year than expected. So from that perspective, the budget is not as expansionary in fiscal policy terms as it was, if, if that's the case. Uh, uh, but I am concerned about the level of debt in this country, and I do think more need to highlight its risks uh, to our nation. I am concerned about the extremely loose monetary policy the Reserve Bank is following and, and saying that they're not going to move rates from near zero for three years, almost regardless of data. Uh, I'm not so sure that's so wise. We've been very, very lucky not to have inflation for really my whole generation, but I, I, I'm always of the view... I, I, I like to read a lot of history and, you know, very ma many generations make the same mistakes that they've just forgotten... Uh, because they haven't occurred in their own generation. And there's, I don't think there's no risk of inflation occurring again. And I think we need to be wary of that. And with a trillion dollars in debt, that's, we've got the biggest debt to GDP, the biggest debt to our economic output since the end of World War II. And I don't want to be dramatic, but we could be on the eve of another conflict. And is it the right approach to be going into such years and such circumstances with very, very historically high debt levels? Yeah, and this is the point about leaving ourselves vulnerable for the next shock, whether it's conflict, whether it's a pandemic. Uh, it can come in a variety of uh, forms. So I'm just hoping that tonight we'll get a bit of a focus on how we're going to repair quickly to ensure that we are in a better position for the next shock. Yeah, look, we went into the um, pandemic not as strongly as we did after the Howard government, but uh, you know, the first uh, six or so years of this coalition government, there had been a serious attempt at budget repair. It was, it was difficult, while economic growth and wage growth in particular was still quite stagnant. Inflation's been low. So that all made it difficult to, uh, to, to pay back debt. But we were headed to a surplus uh, prior to the coronavirus hitting, and that was quite an achievement. Uh, now, all that, of course, has been thrown out the window, but... Uh, I just hope that we don't think that, uh, well, therefore, the, the taps can start opening because, you know, we've got part of this uh, agenda that's seeking to overturn and, and reset, if you like, they use the term reset and build back better. Part of that is this idea of monetary, modern monetary theory. I don't know if you've heard about that, but it's effectively 
the same theories that led to inflation in 17th century France. Yes, indeed. Uh, that led to hyperinflation in v the Weimar Republic, that somehow we can just print money mm. and you'll never have a problem with inflation or other that issues. That it's just call that out. A, a golden goose and free lunch. It mm. doesn't work that way, but we just keep forgetting okay. these lessons. So I hope we don't swallow that particular... Uh, uh, snake oil. Indeed, uh, indeed. Because it would be a great detriment to our economic strength. I'm glad there's people like you warning inside the government. Thanks for joining us, Senator Matt Canavan. I appreciate it.